Hey, welcome back to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. Now, an investigative report by a journalist, Abdulaziz Abdulaziz, you know, has basically uncovered a mass recruitment drive um, within the Boko Haram insurgency in northeast Nigeria. We've invited him to shed more light on his findings. Good morning, Mr. Abdulaziz. Good morning. Thank you for having me. All right. So tell us what you found in the course of your investigation into the Boko Haram insurgency and their recruitment. Well, I think that this is a continuation of uh, my own uh, interest in uh, what is happening, especially in the north northwestern part of the country, uh, what we normally call the uh, banditry. Uh, this is crisis that is afflicting uh, basically four states in the north, uh, in the northwest as well as uh, north central, that is Niger state, the states of Zampara, Kazina, Kaduna, and Niger. Of course, they are worth it, uh, and now we are seeing the emergence of uh, deadly uh, operations of such in uh, KB as well as support our states. So this uh, uh, my latest report is around how this is not only uh, a banditry, I mean uh, rural banditry, but also metamorphosing into uh, Islamic insurgency with uh, uh, insurgent groups uh, like Boko Haram going in there to recruit uh, or try to combat a lot of these uh, rural bandits into their own fault. That is, uh, it is somehow transmitting from uh, what is somehow an aimless criminal activity into uh, some sort of purposeful in court um, uh, movement, uh, which of course is quite dangerous because when you have armed groups uh, transmitting from just some uh, purposeless bandits and criminals into an organized criminal with uh, even doctrinal affiliation. Uh, I think it's uh, worrisome uh, for everybody. All right. Um, we're, we're eventually going to, there's some other aspects that I want to look at. Uh, but before that, let's, let's talk about the availability of uh, recruits. Uh, t paint a picture of what it is it is like in those regions. Is there a readily available number of persons waiting to be recruited um, into these groups? Um, is this as a result of the level of unemployment in those parts? And um, and uh, you know what else you know do we need to know about the availability of recruits into either banditry or into the Boko Haram sect? Well, you know, you cannot exactly put a number to it because this is something that uh, these are people that are in uh, hard rich places uh, operating uh, clandestinely in rural, uh, in forests that are largely inaccessible due to the dangers. Uh, but uh, of course, going by the numbers of these armed uh, men in, in the forest in these states I mentioned, uh, they, they, they run in uh, really thousands. Uh, and uh, as my report indicated, this is, these are areas with very large forests, which uh, if you combine the full, the six states from Niger down up to Sokoto uh, and Kebi, you see that they are that they have over uh, two, almost 260 uh, square kilometers, which is more than even the size of the United Kingdom. So it's a very large area, and unfortunately, in a lot of the forests in these states, uh, there are these criminal elements, and it is these uh, young people with, uh, that are armed, that the Pulani bandits, that the uh, elements, uh, Boko Haram, Aishwab, and Ansaru are now trying to mop up and uh, bring them into their own umbrella. And of course, as I indicated in the story, this is like a move to somehow deflect attention from 
what is happening as in the military operation in the northeast and uh, you know divert attention to this uh, other area and also for the uh, Boko Haram elements to get some sort of subhuman where they can hibernate and also uh, perhaps even get resources because uh, there have been uh, publicly public statements like by the Cardinal State Governor who mentioned that uh, a lot of money from uh, activities of kidnappers in the northwest and of in the northeast. Yeah. Abdulaziz, in your report, you mentioned that Boko Haram um, use emissaries, they use preachers to basically woo these bandits into their fold. Um, can you tell us more about the recruitment strategy of the Boko Haram terrorists? Yeah, you know, those, uh, luckily there are three things. One is, of course, the, the uh, use of logistics. Because, you know, all these criminals, they rely heavily on arms and ammunition. So any help, anyone who can help them secure uh, those, uh, uh, those arms uh, can easily influence the way they think, the way they behave, and all that. So, uh, and of course, because Boko Haram has access, both internally and externally, of uh, a large uh, cache of arms, they can easily, um, you know, help or perhaps try to use that to lure these people. Then, of course, there is also an uh, issue of information because in, in most of these places, like uh, what is happening in, in Niger and Kaduna, you will find uh, Boko Haram elements living side by side with bandits in this forest. So if there is uh, information or intelligence they share with them. Then also there is the doctrinal part in which they try to, uh, they, they try to uh, preach, you know, use clerics to, to, because of course most of these uh, flanny bandits, even though of course they are not really religious, <laughs> so to say, but they, are, they find their roots. In, uh, in Islam, in the sense that a lot of them are originally Muslims, so um, it's easy to 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 use religious sentiments to convert them. Which I, uh, from what I gather, is happening a lot in a lot of these places. Uh, they send emissaries and uh, in form of preachers who uh, try to talk to these people into showing them how they can uh, perhaps uh, get religious backing for what they are doing. Okay, so Abdulaziz, you're saying that these people, Boko Haram insurgents, are using, you know, the background of religion, you know, to convince these bandits to join them. And they're saying it's a jihad, not necessarily that they're massacring people and, and, and killing them. Yes, that is it, because if... Uh, in a situation where they, uh, they they turn the thing into a religious thing, it becomes a jihad, and that and and, and is perhaps easy justification for all these things. If like Boko Haram, we've seen in the south, uh, in the northeast, uh, trying to to do you know uh, to 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 create schisms, to create divisions, in the sense that. And these people don't believe in us and therefore are unbelievers and whatever belongs to them is lawful to us. That is, we can kill them and convert their world and convert their women into ours. So all this, uh, by the time they sell this to, uh, that, that's what they are trying to sell to these guys. And by the time they, uh, um, they, they, they buy this, it, it, it now becomes uh, somehow lawful or legitimate for them to justify all these atrocities to say, oh, we are doing this because uh, these guys are, are not even believers, and uh, we are the believers. And uh, as we've seen from uh, some recent happening, the mastermind of the uh, Yahudi school abduction came out to say things somehow uh, that sound like the usual Boko Haram message that, oh, I don't, I don't steal, but I, I only kidnap uh, foreign
trainers as well as the uh, people who are working with government uh, or, or soldiers. So all this, um, you know, is showing clear, um, clear, uh, upper, clear uh, the, um, alliance, you understand, in terms of talks and ideas. All right. Uh, let's talk about, you know, you had earlier mentioned um, the bandits, Boko Haram and Saru and, of course, uh, ISWAP. How much of a yeah. problem is this for the Nigerian state if we now see these people recruiting more and, of course, uh, spreading a similar ideology um, amongst themselves? Um, is this more of a bigger, is this going to be a bigger problem, rather, for the Nigerian state and the ability to defeat these groups? Well, this means a lot and uh, actually it's, it's really ominous. It is very bad for the Nigerian state because when we have some crises that have lingered for years, you have not been able to contain them and it is metamorphosing into some bigger problem. Because when you have more numbers and perhaps more territorial control, then it means you know, greater power and more little, uh, uh, more, more little uh, 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 you know, danger in the sense that these guys, for example, if uh, they are able to control even no matter how small a place it is, more so that this is place, these forests are really uh, huge and uh, the men in there are a lot. And uh, of course, it's not really all doomed because this is just happening, this is somehow starting, and that is perhaps the, the purpose of the, of the story, to call out authorities to this issue. Of course, I'm sure that they must be aware, but of course, to also put it out there so that those who can take action should hurriedly try to halt what is happening. Because uh, if we allow uh, Boko Haram and Saru and others to take roots, in this uh, northwestern and major state uh, forest, then uh, everybody is in trouble. And what, what kind of action are you referring to now? What 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 should be the response of the Nigerian government uh, to this um, problem that seems to be getting to you know be a hydra headed? Well, I, can, I cannot say exactly because I'm not the government, but uh, actually for me, I think it's really been knee jerk. Uh, because if you see, if you notice how this thing is escalating, the escalation is, is quite alarming, uh, and uh, the the response has not been commensurate with the level of destruction and the expansion we've seen in this problem. Of course, it's not to say that they are not doing nothing. They are trying uh, within perhaps the limits of, uh, and that is talking about security forces, within the limits of what is available to them in terms of men and uh, weapons. But actually, uh, to be frank, the, the effort is not, uh, is not commensurate with the problem at hand. Okay. Um, Abdulaziz, I'm aware that you approached the DSS, the DSS spokesman, uh, Peter Afunaya, um, with your findings. What response did you get? Well, I, I, I got no response because uh, uh, as journalists, of course, no matter the story, we try to talk to people involved because as you just asked me, uh, I was also, I had also wanted to know exactly what is the government response, especially to this uh, changing pattern of the problem. But uh, when I tried to uh, speak with them, uh, they, they didn't get, they didn't give any response because they, 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 there was no response to my inquiry. Hmm. And, and how dangerous do you think this is, a seeming silence from the government in the face of this massive recruitment? And also, how dangerous do you think it is? Because we saw a video recently about Boko Haram insurgents um, pledging uh, their alliance to the IS. Yeah, as I said earlier, this is quite dangerous. And uh, government uh, has to really wake up and uh, immediately there is no time to waste because we've seen so many problems 
uh, like for example, even the Boko Haram itself, or even what has been happening in the southeast, uh, transmitting from a small issue into a huge problem because of mismanagement at the initial stage. Mm -hmm. So we need uh, every effort and every attention to this problem. Because, as I mentioned earlier, if we allow this to linger or to expand and to really take root as the terrorist want, then it is going to be uh, really harmful to uh, even the existence of the uh, of, of corporate Nigeria. Because if you have an unresolved insurgency in the north in the northeast, and then uh, another fraud, a very large one, is being opened elsewhere, then uh, it should worry uh, everybody especially the government and the security uh, security outfits. All right. Um, I, I also want us to go back a little bit. Um, if you recall, I mean, well, I would like to know what you know concerning the m mergers between these groups. If you re recall, after the news of Abu Bakr uh, um, mm -hmm. death, uh, it seemed like there were issues among factions of these groups. Um, not long ago, a couple of days ago, I had seen a story of um, them, of course, coming together, mending fences, um, and becoming one, I believe, and fixing the factional issues that they have. Uh, so tell us a little bit, uh, you know, about uh, what you know about that. Um, the factions that led to the death of Abu Bakr Shekau and the rest of them, are they currently in good terms? Are you aware that they are in good terms and, of course, maybe are now working together? Well, from what is what I know from the, uh, I don't have any studio knowledge, but from what I know, and that was reported of that, and of course a video to that effect is in circulation, that the two sides uh, will coincide and uh, resolve to work together. That is also another danger signal because uh, at a point, these guys, of course, they used to be one, they, they separated, and uh, they later become enemies and kill themselves, which was very positive for the fighting forces on the Nigerian side. But now that they are announcing merger and coming back together, it means that, uh, you know, the destruction which could easily be exploited and while the ammunition they were expanding, uh, expanding among themselves will now be all uh, turned against our own forces and uh, and therefore it's really uh, worrisome and uh, that there should be new uh, renewed vigor, renewed effort to ensure that uh, the, 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 the you know the approach with all seriousness because, uh, as I said, they are coming back means a stronger insurgents. Okay. Okay. Um, Abdulaziz, I want us to address one, you know, fundamental issue regarding the term bandits. You know, it's been a subject of controversy. You know, when, when they're called bandits. And we've had security analysts come out to say, you know, why should they be called bandits? They're Boko Haram insurgents. So are you saying there's a difference between uh, the Boko Haram insurgents and the bandits? And who exactly are the bandits? Are they herdsmen? What exactly do we know about their identity? <laughs> well, that is really a naughty issue. And as you said, it has raised a lot of uh, controversy and uh, back and forth. I think it loves media coinage. Media coinage also happens uh, because it's not like something you sit down and, and, and design or sit down and agree because it's all, that is how the name Boko Haram started. So it's what the media use, the term the media use that sticks. Uh, if you see, for example, the, what happened in the, in the South is especially with the uh, escalation uh, in, in early this year, maybe around um, March up to, you know, up to, May, up to maybe early, early June, you see a lot of things happening. But perhaps the large part of the media decided to call uh, the perpetrators of those actions uh, on non-government, you know. Uh, so it's the same thing with bandits, uh, in the sense that 
This is the early coinage that, okay, these are bandits. Suppose what are bandits? What this mean armed criminals? Uh, and uh, of course, the issue of identity is also there. People will think, uh, why don't you call them this or that? But the thing is, uh, there is, there, there, there is it's a bit naughty in the sense that you don't uh, use uh, a part for the whole. That is what I'm. Uh, what I mean here is, you can't say because, for example, at the start, uh, the Boko Haram elements were largely Kanuris from Borno State or Anyobi. You don't just say uh, every action by Boko Haram and say, okay, Kanuris kill policemen, for example. Or you cannot say Fulani uh, kill uh, abduct uh, people because if you do that, you win. You you. You've uh, sanctioned their their action and and now hung it over every person of that ethnic group. It's not like saying, uh, I, I mean, uh, describing IPOP as uh, as evil, for example. You can't just say evil evil uh, kill police uh, officer. But of course, if you come down to break it, you are, of course yeah, they are evil. Uh, uh, just like maybe majority of the Boko Haram members, especially at the beginning, were Kanuri. Uh, also, the bandits, they are largely full and young people, and uh, I think that is made clear. For example, in my little story, even from the very first paragraph, that was the, the, the word I used, because uh, from their action, from their decision, from everything, they are of full and stock. So, uh, I think uh, it's not really completely wrong if you call them full and bandits. But you don't just oppose or use one for the other. That is you don't say uh, you don't just say full and you just say harder because it's really wrong and that media has really done uh, uh, a bad job there uh, in the sense that uh, we somehow I you know I am a journalist so I don't uh, exclude myself from that. But we somehow uh, helped in escalating tensions, especially at the beginning, uh, during all the happenings in the North Central and all that. So if you say had us, and then uh, now everybody having cattle become a suspect because uh, now it is generic. And of course, not all had us, just like not all. Um, not all, for example, taxi drivers are one chance, that is uh, local criminals, or okay. not all um, fishermen can be bunkers. So all these things, I think, is some naughty but important um, lines that need to be drawn, and uh, every attempt to lock them up uh, actually does, doesn't help. Just like also every attempt to like exclude or to try and exonerate is also not helpful. But Abdelaziz, bandits commit acts of terrorism. So why, why not the term terrorism? And you know, this, uh, like I mentioned, has been a subject of debate. So it seems like calling them bandits is like making light of what they do. That shouldn't we as journalists address them as terrorists since they terrorize well, people? Well, you know, you know, when you, I don't know, perhaps there is really an issue of uh, missing translation. You know, the concept of missing translation in the larger frame, not, I mean, uh, that is, if you say somebody is a bandit, you are not calling that person a holy man. Of course, uh, bandit is a terrorist, because anybody just, uh, perhaps people, uh, the, perhaps the word, to, the, to a lot of years, the word terrorist is, uh, sounds grander and more, but largely bandit, uh, if you check the meaning, is largely the same thing as terrorists somehow. Of course, terrorist is uh, perhaps at the level of more organization, organized and all that. But uh, the dictionary definition of, of bandit shows is a criminal, somebody using gun or using arm to to commit crimes. So it's not like uh, if you say it's a bandit, it's not, you are not calling him a saint or you are not calling him uh, just any other name. You are calling him a criminal. People feel the word bandit perhaps is not strong enough, but I don't think... Exactly. Uh, the, thing, the thing for me is is not uh, the word, because as Shakespeare told us, uh, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. So if uh, the most important thing is how you take them, is the 
and, and how you treat them. Okay. All right. Um, I want us to, of course, uh, still speak on, um, you know, certain, you know, angles with regards, you know, how they have remained successful all the, this while. Well, reasonably successful. Uh, they've continued to exist. You've mentioned that there's thousands of them in these forests, uh, you know, in, in northern states. Um, for a long time, we've had conversations with regards what the government needs to do how to cut off their funding, how to, you know, stop them from being able to get weapons and some of all of that. Um, has there been any success in that regard um, with being able to reduce their access to these high caliber weapons? Uh, is there any, you know, uh, ways that the Nigerian government maybe needs to change its um, tactics to reduce uh, the, uh, the abilities that they have? So can you come again with the question that let me, sir? All right, so I'm asking with regards their abilities uh, to continue to fund their activities and to be able to get weapons. You've mentioned earlier that there's thousands of them in forests across northern Nigeria. Uh, do you think that the Nigerian government is doing well enough with reducing their access to weapons and high caliber weapons yeah. that they use? Um, or do well, we need to I, change tactics? Yeah, that is actually a major part of, of, of all this problem. That is access to weapons, and weapons are what keep foiling this crisis. In as much as there is almost free access to weapons, then you don't know the end when the end will come for this. Uh, it's of course no thanks to our porous borders and uh, our very non-challenged neighbors who uh, perhaps almost allow free access for. Uh, uh, um, uh, for uh, oh, runners to okay. operate, especially uh, countries like Niger and Chad, and from there you see uh, most of these weapons come from there, and from and they are very very much accessible. So it's left to our government and security post and agencies to ensure that we curtail, we cut that link. Once that link is not caught, uh, actually I don't know when we can bring an end to this problem. Because these guys have almost unhindered access to weapons. Of course I understand that some operations have been undertaken lately to, 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 to stop that. And uh, I can see some level of success. but. Uh, I still feel that more needs to be done, and we don't have to, we don't do it alone. We have to ensure that we bring in these our neighbors and uh, make them participate fully to ensure because uh, that if the entry point is not checked, it is somehow difficult to stop things like this at the uh, you know, while they are in. So, so we're basically talking about control. border control, Mr. Abdelaziz, right? Yes. Okay. So also, um, could you tell us if, if you have, you know, the details as to how Boko Ram insurgency is funded in Nigeria? And also, what your thoughts really are um, about Sheikh Gumi and his seeming direct involvement in the activities of the bandits and how he's, you know, seemed to uh, speak up for them in the country? Well, these are really not questions that I can uh, answer successfully because uh, besides what I uh, know, like almost every other person, uh, on, that is on Boko Haram funding, which is, you know, a lot of it are foreign funding because they have foreign collaborators. And uh, about, yeah, I think in May, I had, I reported about how the government has arrested a number of uh, businessmen and bureau the change operators who have been who were used to send money to some of these uh, criminal groups. Uh, they are, that is so. There is that foreign part, but also, of course, locally, uh, we always read about. Uh, broken roads, especially the Bornodamatru Express, 
where they routinely abduct people and then demand uh, a ransom. Okay. Even recently, uh, some staff of a UN agency was released by Boko Haram and some others, along with some about over 10 others. After, of course, uh, you don't have to be told, after payment of ransom. So kidnapping for ransom has been a major uh, means of raising funds and therefore uh, access to uh, money that sustain their operations. Then uh, that is second to the foreign funding coming in. But uh, of course also we are, on, we are not unaware of uh, attacks they sometimes undertake on military formation from where they often uh, up, uh, you know, uh, get weapons and, and other logistics. So all these are uh, some of the, I don't think it's really some uh, obscure thing is, is out there. These are like majorly the means they use to sustain their operations and also get money. All right. And then as for me, uh, because for me, uh, it has been uh, really reckless because, of course, uh, there is uh, negotiators, just like journalists, you can't deny that anywhere in the world they can get, they can have access to criminal groups or individuals. But that should not be an excuse or an alibi for one to uh, somehow uh, turn as crazy as the cleric has gone because uh, in as much as you are he was trying to draw attention to some of the genuine issues uh, regarding this uh, it's also very very uh, unwholesome that he somehow appears to be like, a, like an unofficial spokesperson for these groups uh, there is a line which is somehow very thin but is there between what is uh, the role of a negotiator or a mediator in a crisis like this and also being uh, uh, genuine and also um, with allegiance to your country and uh, not to criminal groups. And uh, I think uh, no thanks to his very uh, uncontrolled statements and uh, very much controversial, of course, because uh, and unguarded. And therefore, it's very difficult, or perhaps it's very legitimate for people to raise questions around his motives, or even, uh, you know, in all these crises. All right. Abdul Aziz, Abdul Aziz, thank you so much uh, for the work you do. I hope you do get that response from the DSS, uh, Mr. Funaya. And um, I also will remind you to stay safe. Uh, we would like to continue to hear from you and to speak with you on these issues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. Stay with us. We'll take a short break. When we come back, we're moving into talking about Namdekanu, who has been rearrested, and the different angles concerning that story. We'll be joined by Nika Gule after the short break. <laughs> 